Good afternoon. Today, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is releasing initial guidance to bring students back to classrooms this fall. Before getting into more details, I'd like to begin by providing an update on COVID-19 testing cases and hospitalizations in the Commonwealth. Massachusetts continues to see encouraging public health data to support our gradual and phased reopening. We'll obviously keep monitoring this information every day. Yesterday, more than 7,300 COVID-19 tests were reported from across Massachusetts. 172 new positive COVID-19 cases were confirmed. The seven-day average for the positive rate of cases remains at 1.9%, marking a 94% decline since mid-April. Additionally, as of yesterday, there are currently 939 individuals hospitalized as a result of COVID-19 and 181 are in the ICU. These hospitalizations represent about a 75% drop since mid-April. We're obviously encouraged by all the progress that's been made here in Massachusetts over the course of the past several months. But as a reminder, we all have a role to play and we encourage everyone to continue to wear face coverings, to practice social distancing and good hygiene. It's obviously made a tremendous difference here in Massachusetts. Please stay home if you're sick and seek guidance from your medical provider if you present with COVID-19 symptoms. We're joined today by members of our administration as well as medical professionals who played integral roles in the design and development of the guidelines for schools to safely reopen in the fall. In developing the back to school plans, the department and our administration considered not only the risks associated with COVID-19 for in-person schooling, but also the risks associated with continuing to keep students out of the classroom. Continued isolation poses very real risks to our kids' mental and physical health and to their educational development. This plan will allow schools to responsibly do what is best for students, which is to bring them back to school to learn and grow. The detailed document released today was developed with extensive conversations with medical experts, school administrators, and other education stakeholders. Commissioner Jeff Riley and his team worked with infectious disease physicians, pediatricians, and the COVID-19 Command Center's Medical Advisory Board to develop these plans. And thanks to that work, the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics supports this carefully developed guidance to bring kids back this fall. School officials now have a blueprint that they can use to create plans using three models of learning with a, a priority on providing in-person instruction. Again, the goal is to get kids back to the classroom, but we're advising districts to develop additional plans. These plans could be implemented if COVID-19 conditions change and districts need to adjust their programs. Commissioner Riley will discuss the three plans details shortly. Over the past several weeks, Massachusetts has seen rates of infection, hospitalizations, and, facility, and fatalities fall steadily, even as the virus remains a significant concern. As we all know, COVID-19 in Massachusetts is not static, and we'll continue to monitor the situation closely to make any adjustments that we need to make. Part of the challenge in developing this guidance is that we're talking about a school year that starts a few months from now, and sometimes it's difficult to forecast where exactly we'll be when we get to September. This guidance assumes that health data continues to stabilize and the requirements are still subject to revision. But now districts can get to work on their preparations to be ready for the fall. We also understand that there are costs associated with implementing many of these recommendations. And that's why we're making available approximately $200 million in additional funding for district school costs related to reopening. This comes on top of the nearly $502 million that our administration made available to cities and towns to spend on COVID-related costs at the end of last month. Massachusetts cities and towns also received almost $200 million in federal elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund grants earlier this year, and additionally, in partnership with legislative leadership, 
our administration is committing $25 million in federal funds to a matching grant program to fund technology purchases for remote learning should it become necessary for school districts. With DESE's guidance and financial support worth just about a billion dollars, school officials have the information and the resources that they'll need to implement the needed distance requirements, classroom configurations, mask and face covering requirements, and symptom checks to make this all happen. Parents and guardians have done their part, stepping up in extraordinary ways virtually overnight to become educators at enormously during an enormously challenging time. Now we have an obligation to do everything that we can to get kids safely back into the classroom so that they can benefit from the guidance and the experience of their teachers, other leaders, and their peers. To sum it up, we really appreciate the work that so many people put in to helping us develop a plan to help kids safely return to the classroom in September. Secondly, this plan was developed with the support and assistance of many members of the infectious disease, healthcare, and physician community, and we're really pleased that the Mass Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics endorsed it. And third, there's almost a billion dollars in state and federal funding that's available to make sure that our districts have the resources that they need to implement this plan. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor Baker. And I wish to thank Secretary Pizer and Commissioner Riley and your teams for your hard work on behalf of our schools and the children of our Commonwealth. Getting kids back to school is good for kids, but it's also good for the entire family. Over these past few months, parents have worked hard to keep their children active, educated, and yes, entertained while balancing work and every other thing that parents juggle. This guidance will implement public health and safety requirements to ensure that as many students as possible head back to classrooms this fall. We, knew, we know how important, how very important it is for kids to be in school, not just for academics, but for their social development, emotional needs, and mental health needs. These rules take every precaution possible and are grounded in the best poss possible medical advice, which you will be hearing from shortly. Massachusetts consistently ranks in the highest in the nation in terms of education quality. And our administration is committed to continuing to provide our children with the high caliber of education and learning that they deserve. As a mother of two high school students, I understand how much of an impact this shift has had on our children's daily lives. From the classroom learning, to after school activities, to team sports. Our students missed a lot this past spring, and it was hard for all of us to see them miss proms and graduations, activities that they so enjoyed, and even saying goodbye to their friends and teachers at the end of the school year. And as we began to reopen the Commonwealth this month, I think a lot of us have, helped, have felt a sense of relief as we begin to transition into new activities. And with today's announcement to reopen schools in the fall, our goals remain getting as many students back as possible into classrooms, into seats, as safely as we can. This guidance gives school districts enough detailed information and flexibility to maximize the number of students they can bring back to classrooms. We understand this will be difficult for schools to make these changes, and we will continue to work with them to support them to implement these new regulations and guidance. Schools will look different in every community as they adapt to this new way of educating to best fit their specific needs and circumstances. We know we are not out of the woods yet in combat, on combating this virus, so we need to live with it. And we must continue to be cautious and vigilant in fighting this disease and protect ourselves, 
our families, and our neighbors. Everyone must continue to do their part. But going back to school has always felt like a new beginning. Getting our children back to school this fall is critical. It's critical to their continued development, both in and out of the classroom. And in order to facilitate a thriving workforce, we need to continue to equip our students with the skills and the education to prepare them uh, to succeed in their future. And returning to classroom is an important step toward this goal. Our kids deserve it. They deserve the opportunity to grow and succeed here in our Commonwealth. I would now like to turn it over to Commissioner Riley. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by thanking our students, teachers, and families for adapting this spring to this unprecedented situation. Today, DESE has sent out initial guidance to our schools and districts, asking them to be prepared for all contingencies for reopening this fall, which typically takes place around Labor Day. Additional fall guidance will be also released in July, so more is coming. This guidance today was built with the help of our medical community, some of whom are here today, our reopening work group made up of students, parents, teachers, nurses, administrators, and other important stakeholders in the education sector. Recognizing we do not have full control over the trajectory of the coronavirus, we've asked schools and districts to prepare for three possibilities or models. The first, which we're speaking about in detail today, is the in-person model. Students return to school and buildings, uh, but schedules, classrooms, and protocols are adapted to meet health and safety requirements we prescribe in the guidance today. The second model is a hybrid model where some students would go back to school while another group would stay home and learn remotely, and then they'd switch, whether that is week on, week off, or different days of the week is to be determined. And then the final thing we are asking districts to plan for is remote learning. In the case, for example, of a second spike of the virus. Simply put, our goal is to get as many students back to in-person learning with the appropriate health and safety requirements in place. This plan allows us to do that for the good of all of our kids. What we have learned from our medical experts is there is no one silver bullet that will help us mitigate risk. Instead, it is a combination of strategies like hand washing or sanitizer, physical distancing, and masks that, when taken together, will make the difference. The health and safety requirements contained within our guidance document are crucial, for they will allow districts and schools to begin planning for what safe in-person instruction could look like in the fall. Indeed, while we are asking for these three plans, we are asking in districts and schools to first prioritize developing the in-person plan with the new safety requirements. The department will closely monitor how this is progressing in the field, and we will offer technical support over the summer to help our schools and districts. And we know that this work will require resources, and that districts will have to plan for those additional resources. We know that in particular, special attention needs to be paid to our historically underfunded school districts, and we are grateful to this administration for releasing new monies today for schools, including a matching grant for technology, even as we recognize the full budget picture is not yet clear. We will continue to update our guidance as the new information becomes available. This is especially true with the new medical research and studies that may come out over the summer and help us to better refine our expectations for what a safe in-person school experience will look like. And with that, it is my honor to turn it over to Dr. Sandra Nelson, an infectious disease specialist from MGH, and she's also on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and Commissioner Riley. As an infectious diseases physician, I am proud that the nation's medical community shifted so quickly into emergency mode as the COVID epidemic surged before us. The impact of this previously unknown illness has been like nothing we have ever seen before. We also recognize, however, that shutting down so much of our society to fight the medical battle, while vital, 
has taken a significant toll on our communities, on our children, their education, and their well-being. Our medical advisory team was asked by Commissioner Riley to review our scientific understanding of COVID-19 in children in order to ensure that medical issues would be an essential driver in any decision about moving education back into the classroom. The message from the medical community remains strong and consistent. We need to get our children back to school as soon as it is safe to do so. While the state of our scientific understanding remains incomplete, we have learned an unprecedented amount in a short time. We believe that the medical literature does, in fact, provide the tenets for a safe return to school. First, children are less likely to acquire COVID than adults. We have seen in large population-based studies, as well as smaller household analyses, that children are less likely to, than adults to be diagnosed with COVID and less likely to get sick when exposed. Second, when children are infected with COVID, they are less likely to get severely ill than adults with COVID. And third, when children acquire COVID, they appear less likely to transmit infections to others relative to adults. This is in contrast to other respiratory virus infections such as influenza, in which children are the major drivers of infection. Modeling studies also suggest that school closures have had less impact on slowing the epidemic down than other distancing measures. With this understanding, and with a reduced incidence of COVID in our community, we do believe that it is safe for our children to return to in-person learning at school. But this does not mean that we can let our guard down, either in the schools or in our communities. Our educational leaders will be instituting measures in the, in the schools to reduce the chance of spread. And these include physical distancing measures, as well as the use of face coverings. The guidance set forth will also be reassessed, both as our state of knowledge about COVID increases and potentially as conditions on the ground change. Return to in-person learning can only be successful if we in the community do our part to keep the rates of transmission low. Now more than ever, protecting and educating our children requires a village. We must all remain vigilant. Our children depend on it, and they deserve nothing less. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Lloyd Fisher, a pediatrician in Worcester and the incoming president of the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Baker. Lieutenant Governor Polito and Commissioner Riley for having me here today and for including the pediatricians in this particularly important discussion and decision about how we can safely bring our children back to school this fall. The Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics represents over 1,700 pediatricians across the Commonwealth who are committed to the attainment of optimal physical, mental, and social health for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. While for most children, COVID-19 has not had the devastating and life-threatening physical health effects that have occurred in adults, the negative impact on their education, mental health, and social development has been substantial. The school experience provides so much more than academic learning and the relationships that children form with their teachers, other school personnel, and their peers are critical to their emotional health and well-being. In my day-to-day -day interactions with children and their families over the past few months, it has become clear that for many, the remote learning experience has been a challenge. It is evident that these children value the virtual interaction that they have with their teachers and their classmates. However, we see how difficult it can be for parents who are trying to work either at home or out of the home, while trying to help their children sign into their Zoom meetings with their class and assist them with their schoolwork. We know that the teachers and the school administrators have worked tirelessly to make the best possible experience for many children, especially those in the younger grades but nothing can take the place of the daily face-to-face -face interaction that our children experience when attending school in person. In addition, children with emotional, psychological, 
or developmental disabilities often receive necessary services through their schools. Because some of these services have been put on hold during the pandemic, continued school closures will be especially detrimental to this group of vulnerable children. We are also concerned with how school closures will likely exacerbate the well-documented achievement disparities across income levels and ethnic and racial groups. The Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education share the goal of bringing most students in the Commonwealth back to in-person learning this fall while minimizing the risk to them, the school staff, and their families. We are quite pleased with the recommendations and are happy to endorse these guidelines. We are impressed with how thorough the work group was in researching the current data and their understanding of the spread of illness, impact of the disease on children, likelihood of children infecting others, and the significant negative consequences that prolonged school closures have on the educational, emotional, and social well-being of children. We recognize that if there is a second wave this fall or winter, we may need to move to a hybrid model or back to full remote learning. These guidelines outline important steps that school districts must take to ensure that if that were to occur, students will continue to advance in their learning. We know that for many parents and children, there will be some hesitation and fear about resuming in-person learning. It is our belief that the mitigation efforts outlined in these guidelines appropriately take into consideration the many complexities of a return to school in the fall and outline the precautions necessary to maximize the benefit to our children while minimizing risk to both them and those whom with they interact. It is also critically important for our children to have a positive experience and feel comfortable with the modifications to this classroom, the curriculum, and their interaction with teachers and peers despite the necessary changes. The understanding and experience that we and those across the globe have with this virus continues to expand each day. I and other pediatricians throughout the Commonwealth look forward to our continued work with the department as new information becomes available that necessitates modifications to these guidelines. I know we all look forward to a time when we can relax some of the changes that our children will see this fall. And I am confident that together we can come up with an appropriate plan to make that happen when it makes sense. Thank you to the administration, the working group, and the members of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for developing a plan that we at the Massachusetts chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics feel is in the best interests of the children in the Commonwealth. Thank you. I will now turn things over to Secretary Pizer. Thank you, Dr. Fisher, and thank you so much for the uh, engagement and support of the Academy in this important work. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my main task today is to introduce Raquel Casada, uh, a parent from Lawrence who has watched her children struggle without the opportunity to go to school each day. Raquel was a member of the Commissioner's K-12 Reopening uh, Schools Working Group that provided input and feedback in today's initial guidance. Raquel is here to underline the importance of parents in this whole process, especially as schools and districts begin working on their own plans and thinking about all the many details that are necessary for implementation. Those details may be small in the context of a district-wide plan, but they can be extremely consequential for individual families and children. So it is critical that parents are fully involved. As we plan for going back to school this fall, we obviously have to make the health and safety of our students, staff, teachers, and communities a top priority. And we have to make sure that parents feel comfortable and confident that the well-being of their children will be our paramount concern. Of course, well-being is not just about COVID, as Dr. Fisher has, uh, has just stated. The absence of school can cause, and already has caused, significant challenges for children and families, certainly related to learning loss, but also exacerbating issues of mental health, food insecurity, and social and emotional development. 
At the same time, when some students are not in school, they are in home or community environments that are not always as well monitored and safe as the school, as the school itself. So even their physical health can be put at risk by school closures. All of these challenges are especially acute for students with special needs, who desperately need access to the support services and the daily routines that only school and only in-person school can provide. I'd now like to turn the podium over to Raquel Quesada to provide her perspective on the importance of getting her children and all children safely back to school as soon as possible. Ms. Quesada. Good afternoon to all the people who are accompanying us present through the screen and different platform. To the government, Charlie Baker, Commissioner Jeffrey Riley, to the all educator, school administrator, parents, and the community members, and to the press for being here covering such an important topic. Thank you for the important opportunity to allow me to speak on behalf of the parents. My name is Raquel Quesada, advocate for the rights of people with disability. I'm also the mother of four children, one with disability. I was a member of the K-12 Working Group Academy Teaching Learning Subcommittee for the state. We have been working very hard, meeting twice a week to develop these guides. As a parent, I was there to make sure that the school official talk about their needs, concern, and fear of the parent when sending their children back to school. There was a voice in this working group to represent parents, and that was me. I feel very comfortable sending my children back to school with these covering health and safety guidelines. My kids have been emotionally stressed by not being in school, and it has not been good for their health and for the entire family. My son with cerebral palsy, he's crying every day because he's very stressed out and because he needs his routine back that will provide his mental health. And I know a lot of parents are in the same situation that I am. Children need to get their life back and parents too. They need to socialize with their, with their peers by taking the necessary measure that are in the new guidelines for requirement to return to school. Parents should be comfortable with those new guidelines for starting school. I'm sure the principal, teacher, professional, and the staff of every school will put all those precautions in place. They will be sure that they are followed by everyone. Life is not about fear. We know that we have to take care of ourselves and our children too. But at the same time, we have to continue our life and living, adapting ourselves to the new normal. Thank you. Now I would like to speak on behalf of the Latino community and Spanish. Muy buenas tardes a todos los presentes. Muy buenas tardes a todas las personas que nos están acompañando tanto presente como a través de la pantalla. Al gobernador Charlie Baker, al comisionador Jeffrey Riley y a todos los educadores, administradores escolares, padres y miembros de la comunidad. A la prensa por estar aquí cubriendo tan importante tópico. Gracias por tan importante oportunidad de permitirme dirigirme a los padres. Mi nombre es Raquel Quesada, abogadora de los derechos de las personas con discapacidades y también madre de cuatro hijos, uno con discapacidad. Fui miembro del trabajo K-12 del Subcomité Académico de Enseñanza y Aprendizaje para el Estado de Massachusetts. Hemos estado trabajando muy duro, reuniéndonos dos veces por semana para desarrollar esta guía. Como madre, estuve allí para asegurarme de que los funcionarios de las escuelas pensaran en las necesidades, dudas y temores de los padres al enviar a sus hijos de regreso a la escuela. Había una voz en este grupo de trabajo para representar a los padres y esa era yo. Me siento muy cómoda enviando a mis hijos de regreso a la escuela 
con estas pautas de salud y seguridad vigentes. Mis hijos han estado estresados emocionalmente, al igual que yo, por no estar en la escuela. He estado en riesgo de salud mental toda la familia. Mi hijo con parálisis cerebral ha desarrollado un nuevo comportamiento de llorar por nada y sé que él necesita apoyo de rutina que le proporciona una escuela para su desarrollo. Los niños necesitan recuperar sus vidas y los padres también. Ellos necesitan socializarse con sus compañeros tomando las medidas necesarias que están en las nuevas guías de requerimiento para volver a la escuela. Los padres deben sentirse cómodos con estas nuevas pautas para empezar las escuelas. Los maestros podrán todas estas medidas en su lugar y estarán seguros de que se cumplan. La vida no se trata de miedo. Sabemos que tenemos que cuidarnos y cuidar a nuestros hijos, pero al mismo tiempo tenemos que seguir viviendo, adaptándonos al nuevo vivir. Muchas gracias. Questions on this? Why not mandate temperature checks? That seems simple, low cost. Um, you know, you need it to get into Boston City Hall. Why, why not mandate that? There was a lot of conversation with the Medical Advisory Board and with um, Dr. Nelson and with the folks from the healthcare and, and pediatric, pediatric, pediatric community. And, um, and we came pretty close when we first started these discussions to making that recommendation with respect to temperature checks. But literally the overwhelming response we got from everybody in the healthcare community was, especially when you're talking about um, kids, there are way too many false positives and false negatives to not only not make it worthwhile, but to create potential issues with respect to what people believe to be true. Um, many kids don't ever become symptomatic. They will test negative because they don't have a temperature. Many other kids will have a temperature because they've been running around in the schoolyard before they went in or just engaging in, in activities that will elevate their temperature. They won't actually be sick and they'll get sent home. And so the overwhelming message that we got from the folks in the healthcare community was with respect to kids, um, temperature checks will actually provide people with a lot of the wrong information with respect to the status of those kids when they show up at school and that will create more problems than simply having a really aggressive program with respect to face coverings, hygiene, hand washing, um, and an appropriate management of the school building. Will all three options be available to parents um, if they don't feel comfortable <clears throat> sending their children back? Or I think I'm going to let... I'm going to let the commissioner speak to that one. So right now we're asking districts to plan for all three models and in fact kind of do a feasibility study on the in-person model. And I think after we uh, let the schools do that feasibility study, we'll have a better answer. But, uh, but parents, I mean, par if there are concerns at home, I think parents want to know whether or not they, if they don't feel comfortable sending their children to school, they want to know if they can continue remote learning or we, we anticipate that we're going to be sympathetic to parents' needs going forward. So our guidance says uh, when feasible, try to get to six feet, but no uh, less than three feet. And that's based on medical research, and I'll let the doctors take it over in a minute. Uh, but what we've seen across the world is France, Denmark, China, Japan, Britain, I think next week, are going towards the three-foot uh, mark because there seems to be growing research that says um, the distance between three and six foot is somewhat negligible. It's when you get below three feet that there are more issues. But, doctor, do you want to take that one? Yes, thank you. We do support the CDC recommendation of six feet of distance when, separate, when possible, and especially when masks are not being used. But we acknowledge that that's not always feasible in a school setting. Uh, and as we started this, we did learn that many other countries and, and also the World Health Organization have endorsed a, a distance of three feet uh, as the minimum distance for separation. 
This is based on the distance that respiratory droplets travel, and respiratory droplets are the major means of transmission of COVID. Uh, the medical literature is still uh, learning about COVID and transmission, but several modeling studies have been done which have looked at three feet of distance uh, vers versus six. And in settings of where the transmission risk is low, such as what we would expect in a school uh, classroom, the incremental difference in transmission risk between six feet and three feet is, is not very high. And then in, on top of it, we're not relying solely on distance, and that's really the most important thing. Distance is part of the mitigation strategy, but we are also recommending or requiring face coverings. We're gonna be emphasizing hand hygiene. We're gonna be cohorting kids together. We're gonna to be uh, really encouraging, uh, mandating children to stay home when they're sick. And it's all of these measures taken together in addition to the distancing as feasible that we believe will keep our schools safe. So the key health metrics, are you referring to uh, potentially transitions between the different models of education? In the report it says if the health, and I don't have to phrase it exact, but if the health data remains in a positive space, then this is likely to be a safe way to return to school. So what are the factors that you're looking at in terms of the key health metrics for that? So the key health metrics are going to be this, this, that we're going to be looking at are going to be the same health metrics that we're using on the dashboard for the reopening of the state of Massachusetts, but we'll also be looking at regional factors as well. Um, and these include the positivity rate, the hospitalization rate, the, uh, the death rate, all rolling averages over time. But the specific details around the metrics and how we will be adjusting between the different models, if, it, if the need comes to that, will be forthcoming in additional guidance. So, uh, so I think there was one study that was cited. There are actually several other studies, uh, but you are right that all of the studies are small. There are a couple of, of points. Um, there were at least three or four different studies that did cluster analyses. So they looked at households, and they looked at where there was an index patient uh, that was infected with COVID, and then looked to see how the circle of individuals in that household around them, uh, whether or not they got infected. And there were really stark differences between uh, adults and children. And there were also differences in the likelihood that a children was the instigator of infection in a household. It was far more common that adults transmit to children than the other way around. There are certainly limitations to this. Uh, there, are, um, there are concerns that part of the reason for that may be that kids just don't get COVID. So if they're not getting COVID at the same rate, maybe we don't know yet about transmission. So I think this is one of those points of evidence that we will be continuing to monitor uh, as, as this evolves over the next months, uh, and, and hopefully not too much longer, but months to year or two. Sure, thank you for the question. We are asking schools to set up a separate isolation room, which is different than the nurse's office, where, for instance, medications might be dispensed, so that we can move students who may be symptomatic to an area where they can go and be safe before they get picked up by their family. And so my guess is those rooms will be nearby the nurse's office, but it will be separate from the nurse's office. Right, and, and part of the reason, if you look throughout our guidance, we're asking um, schools to really think critically about how they use the space in their building, whether that's the library, cafeteria, because often students will be eating in the classrooms, um, auditoriums and the like. So we are, we are going to be recommending uh, that they use their space appropriately. So uh, both transportation and fall sports will be coming out in our July guidance. We recognize that uh, particularly students are anxious to get back to the playing fields. Uh, we also recognize that transportation is a big part of getting kids to and from school. And so we're working with the medical community now to figure out what are the right metrics for how many students can get on a bus. And we are going to try to get those out as soon as possible. How does 
So thank you, it's a great question. I, you know, what we've said is we're gonna be asking districts um, to really focus on our most vulnerable students, including English language learners, including students with special needs. If a district, for example, uh, is in a hybrid model for whatever reason, we would ask that a district consider sending uh, substantially separate special education students in, not every other week, but every week because we know that, particularly for some of our complex special education students, there's been some regression, and that they really count on the services that happen only in schools. And we wanna really um, offer that kind of ability for families who really need some extra support. So um, we're not gonna know the answer to that one for uh, probably 30 days or so. Um, I wish we had the answer today, but we don't. Uh, there are two major elements to answering that question. The first is, uh, what are the April tax payments gonna look like when they get made on July 15th? Remember, every state in the country basically moved their, um, their biggest month of the year in terms of tax payments, which is April, uh, from April to July when the pandemic began to match the federal uh, change in, in federal filings. The second is uh, the current dialogue that's going on in Washington with respect to uh, a state and municipal support package associated with COVID and some updated guidance on how states and municipalities can spend the very significant resources that have already been ava made available two states and cities and towns by the feds. Um, I've said before that there's a lot of very positive dialogue that's going on between the House and the Senate and the administration over both of those issues, but they have all told us that this is an issue that they're gonna deal with uh, in the second half of July, and we're not gonna know an answer to that until then. But in the meantime, on a lot of the incremental expenses the communities have expressed concerns about, we basically now have $935 million, not counting the $194 million that have already gone out in federal funding uh, in grants for COVID-related expenses that are going to be available to cities and towns across the Commonwealth. It's a big number. Governor, what's your message to teachers? I don't see any teachers represented up here today. Pardon me? What is your message to teachers? I don't see teachers represented up here today. Um, you know, some the members of some teachers' unions are saying these are way too <laughs> lax and they don't take into account uh, what teachers have to do now. Do you want to speak to that one, Kamish? Sure. I, I guess what I would say is we are using the best medical advice. I think Boston is known historically for having perhaps the premier outstanding medical community in the world, and we're relying on them for our health and safety guidelines. And uh, we take very seriously the health and safety of our teachers as well, and we'll continue to do so. And we're going to continue uh, working with our teachers' unions uh, on numerous issues as we go forward over the summer. We're hearing about a lot of teacher layoffs. I guess we're, we're hearing about a lot of layoffs um, right now in, in education and teachers. It sounds like so it's, it's it, more it, teachers for this. So what I would say is it's not uncommon. Um, at this time of year for non-renew notices to go out to teachers under three years. I do think there's been a spike this year because there is concern uh, perhaps from districts that uh, the budget is unclear. Uh, in the past, we've been able to hire back people, and we hope that will be the case as well. Um, I do think that, you know, the additional resources the governor is giving and the hope for the federal stimulus money and whatever happens with Chapter 70 will allow us to go back to in-person schooling in a robust format. That's one of the... The issue with respect to how we manage um, the fall with respect to um, community outbreaks, uh, I think is one that we're currently discussing, not just with our colleagues in education, but with our municipal colleagues as well. Um, in March, I think it was fair to say that uh, we believed we were dealing with community spread pretty much across the Commonwealth. And uh, and at that point in time, we also didn't have anywhere near the kind of testing or tracing infrastructure in place that we have now. Um, I don't want to prejudge where we're going to end up on this, 
but I do believe that we'll have far better tools um, to make decisions on, uh, on how to deal with outbreaks um, in the fall than we had this past spring. And in this past spring, I think our view was we got to the point where the only thing that made sense um, was to basically move to an essential business model and a stay-at-home advisory across, and a closing of schools across the Commonwealth. Um, I think part of the reason why the commissioner and the folks who worked on the reopening advisory board wanted to go with put together three models was because they do want to be able uh, to head into the fall with an appreciation for how those models would work depending upon what's going on on the ground in certain regions and communities in the Commonwealth. Um, but that is an issue that we believe we need to work through. I think we have far better tools now than we had then with respect to surveillance to be able to target our interventions more appropriately. And if you look at what's been going on, especially um, in, the, in, the, in the Far East, which is ahead of us with respect to a lot of these issues, the way they've managed, um, the way they've managed outbreaks since, uh, particularly with respect to schools, has been on a, on a region by region basis and not on a, um, on a statewide or a provincial basis. Um, first of all, uh, several of those reforms um, are ones that uh, we have been working with a variety of the constituents that are involved uh, for a while on. Um, but as I said yesterday, the report made a series of recommendations based on their findings, uh, and we said we were going to file those and additional ones as well. And some of the ones we filed uh, are ones that are very particular and specific to the issues that were raised in the report um, and, the, and the aftermath. But some of those we've been working on with people for a while. Governor, it seems like wearing face coverings are a really important part of this recommendation. And yet, are you really expecting a second grader to wear a face covering all day in a classroom that sometimes is not air conditioned, for instance? You like the pediatrician speak to that? We, we have some good experience in just in my own office, in activities that, yes, um, children of all ages have had some good success with wearing masks. Are all children going to be successful? No. And we know that children with certain developmental disabilities, um, certain behavioral concerns are going to struggle with it. Um, that being said, the more that are able to wear a mask, the more we reduce the transmission. And as has been said before by Dr. Nelson and others, we look at all of these mitigation efforts as a package, and we need to combine the mask wearing with the physical distancing and with um, hand washing and hygiene and all of the other mitigation efforts that, that we've talked about. Um, one of the things that is in these guidelines, which I was very pleased to see, is there are going to be routine breaks throughout the day, and the details of those are, are going to be forthcoming in, in the guidelines that are released later. But I do think that is important to have these children have some time where they can take their masks off in a physically distant situation so they will be able to breathe and they will take some, some rest from the mask. But I, I do have to say, just from my own experience working with my own children in my family and in my office, is that I've been surprised at how successful some of these younger children have been. And we've seen evidence of this in other countries as well where they have implemented masks. Can I just say one thing about, because several people have brought it up about um, uh, kids with special needs. Um, and I really appreciate, Raquel, you being here today to speak to this issue. Uh, we, the Lieutenant Governor and I, have heard from a lot of families over the course of the past several months. And um, everything from uh, the, remo the remote learning program that was put in place by uh, our kids' school was terrific to it was a disaster, all right? Um, I would say that the overwhelmingly most powerful messages that we have heard have been from the parents of special needs kids who believe that their kids have regressed dramatically over the course of the past few months. And I can't emphasize how important, especially for those kids and their families, that FaceTime and that daily routine and that constant 
sense of communication and progress is to their ability uh, to continue to grow and develop. And, uh, and this one sometimes gets lost in the conversation. I don't want it to get lost today because we've heard from, a, that is probably the single biggest parent group we've heard from who are profoundly worried about um, their kids' future development. Uh, I don't believe at this point any of them have resigned. Why not? They are the ones who made the uh, decision to hire Superintendent Walsh. I think it's a worthwhile question. We're currently talking to him about and it. And you are the uh, you're the person who appoints that board of trustees. Correct. Uh, although I don't, I honestly, as I stand here, I don't know how many of those folks were appointed by us and how many were appointed previously. They serve seven-year terms. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Urena. Pardon me? Your reform to the Soldiers Home called for an executive director to oversee the facilities. Is that the same as the position um, that has been sitting vacant since 2016, and why was that never been? Actually, it's not the same. Um, it has significantly more direct oversight and support for uh, the Soldiers Homes than the current legislation. But as I said yesterday, there's no excuse for having not filled that position. Thanks, I think, um, I think the report that was released by uh, Mark Perlstein uh, was thorough and comprehensive. He talked to 100 people, reviewed more than 15,000 documents, and, um, and I think it was incredibly painful and extraordinarily well done. And I would hope that at least the recommendations that he made that we filed, uh, irrespective of what else people on the legislative side might want to do, can find their way into state law shortly. Thank you. Governor, Governor, quick question on the unemployment scam. We are hearing from a lot of people um, on that. Can you tell us, um, some people haven't received checks since Memorial <clears throat> Day. Um, can you tell us how many unemployment claims have been frozen out and also um, how many fraud reports have been filed? You're talking about um, thousands and thousands of uh, attempts to steal money from the unemployment trust fund. And I do know, because I've talked to people about specific cases, that there are people who are calling a variety of places complaining about the fact that they didn't get their check. And when we follow them up, sometimes we follow them up, it turns out it's legit, and sometimes when we follow up, it turns out there's somebody who's working on behalf of the fraudsters to try to get funds released that we've already determined are, in fact, fraudulent to begin with. This is an enormously difficult issue, and um, the best I can say about this at this point in time is we stood up the program before anybody else did. We have 300,000 people who are currently getting paid under the program. This is the PUA program. The DUA program, we have almost 700,000 people who are getting paid. And uh, and we are putting mechanisms in place that have been recommended by the feds and by others to double check and triple check that people are in fact who they are. And in some cases, um, it's a very complicated exercise to figure this out. Uh, we're not happy about the fact that we can't just continue to make the funds available as quickly as we possibly can, um, but people are working really hard to make sure that people are in fact who they say they are. And when you're dealing with people who are as sophisticated as these people are, that can often be complicated, and I, um, and I wish that uh, I wish we, we didn't have to deal with this, but we do. And, um, and and I guess what I would say is that there has been a lot of very direct uh, communication and information that's been provided to people about what it is they need to do uh, if they are in fact the person who actually submitted um, the information to to. Um, to clarify that they are the person and to validate it and to be able to then get paid. And the one other thing I would say about this, and it's probably cold comfort, is for those who we are processing on this stuff and trying to get to the bottom with respect to what's real and what's not, um, once we validate that they are in fact who they are and the claim is in fact submitted by them and wasn't submitted by somebody else or that somebody else isn't working it uh, on their behalf even though they're not unemployed, um, they get paid for everything they're entitled to back to the start of whatever their date was that they submitted their original application. But this is a really complicated issue. Any idea how much money the state's lost yet? Any idea how much money the state's lost? 